I'm sorry for the interruption, ma'am. Your mic is on mute, ma'am. Okay, I'm I'm very sorry. Very good evening to all. Welcome to the second day of international virtual talk series on revisiting English language and literature. On behalf of the School of English, Kumulaguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, I, Dr. Radhika, Associate Professor in English, extend a warm welcome to all the viewers. The topic of today's talk is what lies between the pen and the reader. Only words, a fascinating insight into writing skills. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this evening, Dr. Chumki Biswas, an assistant professor in TSEC Mumbai. She holds doctorate in the field of English language teaching from the University of Mumbai and is actively involved in extensive research in task-based teaching for listening and speaking skills. Equipped with 18 years of teaching experience, she is often invited as an area expert in various well-acclaimed institutions, including Tata Institute of Social Sciences. She has been associated with Oxford University Press since the last 13 years as a subject matter expert and has conducted over 400 workshops and seminars in areas like English language teaching, soft skills, business communication, organizational behavior, to name a few. Last year, she had a very rare privilege of being selected as a key member of the Mumbai University's Board of Studies, and she has helped redesign the syllabus for two subjects on professional communication and ethics for engineering students. She is also associated with various international organizations like Prometric, USA, Sprout School of Business, Canada, and Oxford University Press in UK in the capacity of an expert. We are so privileged, uh, Dr. Chumki, to have you here uh, with us today evening. So welcome you again, and the session is yours now. Uh, good evening to all the participants. Uh, thank you, Radhika Ma'am, for that uh, lovely introduction. Now, I also want to thank you for inviting me for this talk today. Now, she wanted me to speak on writing skills. And as you know, writing skills is a very, very broad topic. So I was in a dilemma as to where to start and where to end. Uh, so I uh, spoke to three of my mentors, and all three of them suggested that, Chunki, please go back to the basics. So that is exactly what I plan to do today. I'm going to stick to the basics. And towards that, uh, let me first uh, share my slide. Just give me a few moments here. OK, so the way I have uh, named my uh, topic for the webinar today is what lies between the pen and the reader and its only words. And I have been a little optimistic in calling it a fascinating insight. I hope I can keep up the fascination. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a little background to the title of today's webinar. So towards that, I want to show you a few pictures on my slide and I want you to identify the people that you're going to be seeing on the screen. So here I go with the second one. This is the third picture and this is the fourth one. So I'm sure all the people who are there watching uh, will find no difficulty in identifying these people because they are very, very well known. Uh, still, I'll just go ahead and flash their names here. Now, uh, as a quiz, this was not difficult, but in the next slide, I'm going to show a few other pictures and this time uh, see if you can really identify the people on the screen. The first one is here. This is the second picture. This is the third one. And this is the last one. Now, when you see these pictures, I feel uh, quite a few of us will not be able to identify these people. So let me just go ahead and show you the names of these people. And now you'll be like, oh, of course, this is O. Henry, this is Virginia Woolf, we have Tolkien, and we have Mahashweta Devi. 
Now, the reason you found it so easy to identify the people in the previous slide and yet so difficult to identify the people on this current slide is because when we're talking about actors, actors impress with their physical and vocal attributes, and we keep seeing them on the screen, and we know them by the looks. But when we're talking about writers, writers, all they have are only words to impress the audience with. And with these words, we can plumb the depths of the notion, and we can scale the heights of the highest mountain. So let me go to the next slide. And here, I'm going to be talking about the power of the written word. And I want to draw a comparison between the spoken words and the written words. Now, when you're talking about spoken words, we are often slammed with the non-native tag. And look, often people jeer at our uh, you know, accent in the way we speak. And it is a bitter truth that many of us have been refused jobs in Western countries just because we are not native speakers of English, even though you might be having substantial amount of experience in teaching the language. But when you're talking about the written word, the written word allows you to transcend all geographical boundaries and our skin coloring doesn't matter anymore because what goes out from you to the reader are only words. Next, I'm going to be talking about how the spoken words, it's similar to an arrow that never returns. So once the words leave our lips, it goes into the listener's ears and pierces right to the heart. And there is no way you can recall what you have said. But when you're talking about the written word, the beauty of the written word is that it allows you enough time to think analyze and edit and that is why i say long live the backspace key or the delete key because you have the time to edit before you actually post it for people to read the next thing i'm going to talk about spoken words is it reminds me of bubbles because spoken words are ephemeral and they're gone with the wind but when we're talking about the written word written words defy sands of time and you can pretty much immortalize your words for all the future generations to come so now that i've spoken about the power of the written word the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to show you what lies between you as a writer and a famous writer the steps to being a famous writer is through skillfully written words and hence I have called my webinar today as what lies between the pen and the reader are only words. And I want to draw your attention to the word skillful because you just not merely write words, these words have to be skillfully written. And hence, today I plan to show how we can refine our writing. Now, um, now all um, sessions on writing skills are mostly workshops because it's best that you uh, do it face to face, you write, you analyze it, and then you give the feedback. Unfortunately, today it is just a webinar, so I'll try my best to share some examples. Now, next, I'm going to be talking about a little bit of theory on language acquisition and how it actually happens. Now, when we're talking about language acquisition, we have something called the natural order of language acquisition. And this is uh, the way in which we learn our mother tongues and we learn it pretty fluently. So when you're talking about language acquisition, it basically talks about acquiring four sub skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And mind it, they are known as skills because you need to learn them. You are not born with them innately. So just like you uh, pick up you know, uh, driving skills or you pick up, uh, you know, uh, maybe painting skills. Similarly, you have to learn, you have to train yourself to use a language. So when we are talking about a mother tongue, we start with listening and we start right at the crib when we are born. And through listening, we are able to listen to the sounds of the language of a mother tongue. From listening, once we have uh, you know, acquired enough sounds, we move to speaking. And speaking is where we start by imitating the sounds. And then we move from the sounds and start associating the sounds to meanings. And once we are able to speak somewhat fluently enough, we move to reading. And the last one of the four sub skills is writing. 
Now, the natural order says that we always do the easier things first and we learn difficult things later. So when you're learning to cook, maybe the first thing you learn is how to boil an egg or maybe make some Maggi and you leave the more difficult stuff like making biryani for uh, later days. The similarly, you know, listening is the easiest of the four sub skills, a little difficult than listening is speaking. Reading is more difficult than speaking and writing is the most difficult and hence it is acquired last and it takes a lot of effort to be a good writer now when I'm talking about acquiring a second language in India the scenario is very different and the way we learn English in India is quite different now India as we know our educational system puts a lot of focus on reading and writing skills and we try to apply the same concept to the concept of learning a language so the way we learned English is quite unnatural because we started from the reading stage I think every household in India has that five page booklet where A stands for apple and B stands for ball as if A cannot be for anything else. So we start by first recognizing the written form. We start with reading and then our parents, you know, they aspire to make us good writers. So they make us, you know, hold the pencil and we learn how to form the, uh, the fonts and hence we move to writing. And I remember uh, simply spending hours doing cursive writing even before I took admission into school. So once we have you know, learned how to write a little, then by the time we are four years of age, we were sent to school. And if we were lucky to go to a good English medium school, then this is actually the first time we were exposed to substantial quantities of uh, listening. You know, otherwise our listening would be, you know, a kind of restricted to a few words here and there, or maybe one or two nursery rhymes that our parents would, uh, you know, teach us. So once we are in the kindergarten and we listen, listen to our teachers talk maybe three or four hours a day, by the time we reach the age of five or six, we gather some amount of confidence to frame our own sentence. And that too, you know, we would practice the sentence maybe 10 times in our head before we get the courage to raise our hand in the classroom and tell the teacher, Miss, may I go to the toilet? So you have to understand that the way we went about learning English was very unnatural. So it's like instead of eating it in a straightforward way, we went about in a roundabout way. And hence, when we talk about our English proficiency, I feel that our English is quite fractured. Now, many of you will take offense to me saying that our English is fractured because maybe you've been using the language and teaching it for the last 20, 30 years. So how can I go ahead and call our English is not very good or fractured? Now, there is a simple litmus test to uh, test for yourself how good you are in a language is uh, when you sleep in the night you need to uh, remember which language do you dream in. Uh, do any of us dream in English? No, I think the only language that we dream in is in our mother tongue because that's the only language that we learned it in the correct way, in the natural order. So this is something that has come from uh, the past, the kind of educational system that we have. So we put a lot of focus on reading and writing as we do in other subjects, but the same thing cannot be applied to learning a language. And hence, you know, the problems that our generations have faced, we do not want to kind of repeat the same kind of, visit the same kind of problems to the next uh, generation. So my request is that, you go by the natural order and start by teaching a language from the listening stage. So now that I've spoken about the natural order of language acquisition, the next I'm going to be talking about the receptive versus productive skills. Now, when we're talking about uh, the sub skills, the sub skills are divided into receptive and productive skills. And I'll explain to you uh, with an example. So when a child is born, when it comes into this world, uh, uh, it pretty much is blank in the head. There is no information in the head. So when you don't have anything in stored in the head, you possibly can have produce or come up with something. And another good example would be uh, if you first go and purchase a laptop, you cannot bring it home, plug it, and start working on it. What you need to do first is you need to uh, you know, install the operating system. So the simple thing is that without any kind of input, you cannot 
possibly have an output. So the first of the sub skills, listening, is all about storing the sound of the language. And once you understand the sound, you start by trial and error to match the sounds with the meanings. OK, so this is listening. And listening is a receptive skill because it gives you input in terms of the target language that you are learning. Now, once you have, uh, you know, you are comfortable listening, what you want to do is you're pretty much like a monkey and you want to mimic the sounds that you've been hearing. So speaking starts with mimicking and then you start practicing the sound and you start practicing the structure of the language. But as compared to listening skills, speaking is a productive skill because you are giving some kind of output, you're producing language. Next, we are moving to reading. Reading, again, is a receptive skill because here you are, again, storing up on words. You're gorging on words. You're increasing your lexicon. And you're also you know, polishing up your style by reading more. So again, this is an input subskill. And the last one, the most difficult of these four subskills, is the writing skill. So we start first by imitation. And then when we get more confident with the structure, we start creating sentences of our own and we become more original writers. And writing, again, is an output subskill. So these are the four subskills. And what I have to say is that you possibly cannot skip any of these subskills. For example, if you start from the reading subskill, then you're doing yourself an injustice and you're doing your students an injustice because there is no shortcut to learning a language properly. So you must start with listening, go to speaking, reading, and then writing. And you cannot hurry the process. You know, you cannot expect people to become good writers just by a training of one or two days. So towards that, let me just go to the next uh, slide. And here, I'm going to be talking about the critical age of language learning. Now, uh, you can never be too early to learn a language, but often you may be too late because the brain loses its plasticity after puberty. So uh, the brain is geared in such a way where it easily picks up language the younger you are. So let me give you an example of myself. I uh, came to Bombay in the year 2000, and despite being in Bombay for 20 years, I'm still unable to speak Marathi very well. And that is because by the time I was exposed to Marathi, my brain had already started losing its plasticity and the capacity to pick up and internalize uh, newer languages. So my advice is that if you want to give language training, start right at birth, exactly the way that you learned your mud tongue. Uh, the next point I'm going to make is that a child can pick up multiple languages concurrently. Now, many parents and teachers uh, uh, you know, talk about the fact that you know, they are speaking three or four languages uh, you know, in the house, and the child might get confused. But research shows that a child is very much capable of picking maybe three or four or five different languages simultaneously and with equal ease. So just go ahead and expose your children to different languages. And the earlier you start, the better it is for them. Uh, the last point that I would like to talk about is if the input is poor, then the output will also be poor. If you're listening to less amount of English, you will be able to speak less. And consequently, you will also be able to write less. Similarly, if you're exposed to incorrect, grammatically incorrect English, then you will also be producing incorrect uh, you know, English while speaking or writing. So the simple fact is the more input you give, the better quality of input you give. And the more quantity of input you give, the better output you will get from your language learners. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is no shortcut in life or in writing. And writing is the most difficult of the sub skills. So the starting point is not from reading. The starting point is from, from listening. And you need to listen to good standard English. You need to expose your learners to copious amounts of good English. Next is you're going to be talking. I'm going to be talking about how you need to read, read, read till you drop dead. Now, some of us in our generation, even though we did not get much exposure to listening, we kind of made up for the lack of input by reading a lot. So if not listening, at least the next best thing you can do towards becoming a good writer is to read. And here, I have a wonderful quotation from Mahashweta Devi. And she says, I have read more books than I have eaten food. The matter for my writing comes from there. 
So the next thing I'm going to talk about is how you need to write not a lot in terms of quantity. Writing a lot in quantity will not make you a good writer. But when you write willingly, when you write happily, and you try to focus on fine tuning, then you get good quality of writing. So next, I'm going to take a peek at some of the major genres of writing. Now, here is a problem because there is so much to writing, and I really did not know, you know what all I could include in this one hour that I'm going to be spending with you. So what I had done is I've analyzed writing in terms of its purpose. So if you want to be a good writer, the two things that you need to keep in mind is that every piece of writing, every word that you write, should have a purpose, clear-cut purpose. And not only that, uh, every writing that you have should also be focus towards a particular kind of audience. So the purpose and audience decides what you're going to write. So I have divided the genres of writing on the basis of purpose, and I have divided into three kinds. The first one is a business writing. The second kind would be the academic kind of writing. And the third one is creative writing. Now, when I'm talking about business writing, the purpose of business writing is very clear. It is about making money, and money transactions lie at the heart of good business writing. So I call it food for the body. Everything that you do in everyday life, you know, you're going for a job, you're teaching uh, for a job, all of this is for money, and this money feeds your body. But when we're talking about academic writing, academic writing, the purpose is to acquire knowledge not only to acquire knowledge, but also to disseminate knowledge. So I call it food for the mind. And the last kind of writing, creative writing, is mostly done to entertain. Now, there are two purposes to creative writing. The first one is to entertain your reader. But there can also be a second purpose of writing, and that is to entertain yourself. But then, nevertheless, the purpose is that it provides food for the soul. So I don't have a lot of time to go into great depth into each of these kind of writing. So I will just take a few examples of business writing here. So I could come up with business letters, memos, you know, proposals, uh, instruction manuals, legal contracts, uh, minutes of a meeting, you know, resumes, uh, CVs, cover letters, advertisements, and we also have uh, business reports. Now, I have used the word technical here. Many of us confuse the, the origin of the word technical as coming in from the word technology, but technical refers to technique and not technology. So any kind of writing that requires specialized knowledge of technique comes under technical writing or business writing. Next, I'll be moving to academic writing now. In terms of academic writing, we have um, essays, academic essays, we have reports, we have projects that we do in schools and colleges, we have research papers, research articles, we have uh, MPhil dissertations, and we have PhD theses. Now, there might be other kinds of academic writing, but these are the most common and prevalent ones in terms of academic writing. Next, I'm going to be talking about creative writing, and if I talk about some of the things that we can keep under creative writing. I could come up with poetry. Uh, we have prose. We have dramas, plays. And we also have screenplay scripts for any kind of adaptation in the dialogue form. You know, uh, For example, for a movie, we have to you know, kind of make the adaptation maybe from a novel uh, to a screenplay script. Next, we have memoirs. We have personal essays, speeches. And even songs come under the umbrella of creative writing. Now, uh, I would love to go in depth into all of these kind of writing, but I do not have the luxury of time. So what I've done is I'm going to be talking about a few basic writing tips that are applicable to all forms of writing, be it uh, business writing, academic writing, or creative writing. So the first thing that I'm going to focus on is to simplify the concept of cohesion and coherence. Uh, I have heard a lot of people uh, speaking about these two words in the same breath, and uh, most of them use them as synonyms of each other, and uh, they use it interchangeably. Now, if I'm talking about a generic definition, then yes, you're correct. Both cohesion and coherence talks about you know, how a text is connected to make a unified whole. 
but I want to look into cohesion and coherence uh, in, in a more uh, you know, fine-tuned manner. So when I'm talking about cohesion, cohesion, according to me, is the connection between words and sentences. Whereas when we're talking about coherence, then coherence talks about the connection uh, between maybe uh, the topic, uh, the uh, uh, topic statement, the thesis statement, uh, the summary, the conclusion. Now, when we're talking about cohesion, it is related to the flow of words. But when we're talking about coherence, it's related to the overall structure of your written discourse, how you arrange your different paras, what you put as a heading, how you start, what you include in the body, and maybe how you conclude. Now, when we're talking about cohesion, cohesion is at the sentence level, but coherence is at the organization of the entire written discourse. So when I'm talking about cohesion, I call it at the micro level because it is more focused and it is at the, at the sentence level, uh, but coherence is at the macro level. Now for today's session, uh, I will not uh, look on coherence because this is something that we as teachers pretty much drill into our students where we talk about the introduction, body, and conclusion. So I will not be looking into it. For that, I would need a whole new session. So I would like to focus mostly on uh, cohesion and cohesive devices. So towards that, I'll go to the next slide. And here I'm going to be talking about the CSI order for cohesion in writing. Now, CSI is an acronym, and I will explain to you what I mean by that. When you're writing, you need to follow any, some, some kind of order. So the first order that you can follow is the chronological order. Now, when I'm talking about the chronological order, you can explain maybe even in a history in the form of a timeline. You can relate uh, you know, your experience as a traveler in the form of a travelogue. So all of these would be chronological order. Furthermore, if you're talking about you know, the steps involved in uh, you know, doing something, these will go in the chronological order. Uh, the next one is the spatial order. This is where you help the reader to visualize something as you want to see them. So for example, you're describing uh, you know, a particular uh, person, then it is you who decides whether you want to start from the head or you want to start from the toe. So you decide the order. This is known as the spatial order. And the last one is the order of importance. So when you're writing persuasive literature, you know, or you're trying to convince someone, you have to prioritize your items and you arrange them in an order of importance. Maybe you show them the bigger benefits and then the smaller benefits later. You show the larger significance of things and then you move to uh, lesser significant things. So this is the CSI and the C stands for chronological, the S stands for spatial, and I stands for the importance of the order. Next, I'm going to be talking about five cohesive techniques that we use uh, often, but maybe we do not underline it so uh, prominently or explicitly when we are teaching it in the classroom. So I'll start with reference words. And I've given an example here. The Taj Mahal was built in 1632. It was commissioned by Shah Jahan. So when I'm using the word it, it, it refers back to the Taj Mahal, which is the subject in the first sentence. And I continue it in the next sentence by using a pronoun. This is known as reference. Now, the next one is repeated words. Uh, I've given an example here. The Taj Mahal was built with white marble. The marble was procured from Makrana, Jaipur. Now, you will notice that in the first sentence, I've used the word marble. And in the second sentence, I've gone ahead and again used the word marble. I'm repeating it. Now, you repeat words not only for emphasis on you know, very key words, but also uh, because it helps you move from one sentence and go to the next sentence. But there is a word of caution here. You must not use uh, you know, repeated words uh, too often. You must use it sparingly, or your uh, writing becomes very, very repetitive. Next, I'm going to be talking about substitution. Now, here is an example. Apart from marble, semi-precious stones were also used. Some of these were jade, turquoise, coral, lapis lazuli, and agate. Now, I want to point out to the word these here. Instead of semi-precious stones, I have substituted with the word these. Now, you will notice that substitution is also a form of reference. 
So uh, substitution is a subset of reference. In reference words, you mostly stick to pronouns. But in substitution, you can use other uh, you know, forms of words other than pronouns. So all substitutions at the end of the day are reference words. But all reference words may not be a substitution. Next, I'm going to be talking about ellipsis. Now, the more proficient you become in writing, you start using ellipsis. But this comes uh, with practice. In the initial days of writing, uh, students might not be able to produce this in their writing. Now, what is ellipsis? Ellipsis is the omission of words, you know, repeated words. So let me give you an example here. Quite a few precious stones were also used for the inlay work. The first one was gold stone. The second was magnet stone. Now here you see I have omitted the words, the second precious stone. But even though I have omitted the two words precious stone, my meaning is pretty clear. And uh, grammatically, also, this is correct. And this shows that you are gaining more proficiency as a writer. So this comes when you become a better writer. The last one I'm going to be talking about in terms of the cohesive techniques is the transition signal. Now, a good writer prepares the reader for what is going to come up next. So here is an example. Uh, the construction of the Taj Mahal um, in the construction of the Taj Mahal, three types of stones were used. The first type was semi-precious stone. The second type consisted, consisted of rare stones. The third one was common stones. Now, this is what you know allows people to read in a systematic way and also uh, gives them the idea that the writer is pretty clear about what he or she is trying to say. Uh, this is very similar to how when you uh, travel on the highway and you see you know, um, the markers on the road, which tells you that there's a food mall maybe 500 meters along, or maybe after one kilometers, you will find a toll gate. So these are basically kind of signals that prepare the reader and um, make them understand what to expect next. So transition signals are very, very important in terms of uh, cohesive devices. And here, what I've done is I've given a pretty exhaustive list of the different kind of transition signals that your students uh, will be using when they are writing something. Now, I could give only two examples of each type because there is not much of space on the slide. So let me just take one or two of these. Now, if you're talking about uh, maybe contrasting, uh, you can use phrases like on the contrary or on the other hand. I will go to the sixth one here. If you want to express certainty, you can uh, use words like undoubtedly, or you can talk about, of course. Now, I'm moving to the next slide here. Let me uh, talk about maybe the 10th one. Uh, to mark time, you can use phrases to begin with or subsequently. And maybe to conclude, you can use words like to summarize or in short. Now, this is uh, um, you know uh, the transition signals. The list is exhaustive, but the two examples I have only given two. You can prepare a list like this and put it up in your classroom so that uh, writers who are in the beginning days of writing, you know, initially and pretty untrained, they don't have to hunt around for transition words. They can simply pick and choose a sum from the list that you have displayed. Uh, next, I'm going to be talking about the importance of punctuation. Uh, you know, when you're speaking, you have uh, the benefit of the voice and your voice modulation, your tonal inflections does the job of punctuating your message. But when you're writing, your writing becomes pretty flat if you do not use punctuations correctly. So I want to show you an example of what a poor, poor punctuation can kill your message. So this one, uh, it talks about no, we want more rape, how terrible that sounds, instead of saying that no more rape. So you can see pretty much how disastrous you know, poor punctuation can be to your writing. And mind it, this picture is from uh, English speaking country. So if the native speakers can make such mistakes, uh, you know, it is anybody's guess what, you know, second language learners can do in terms of poor punctuation. So in the next slide, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of uh, the examples that I'm going to show you to show, uh, you know, the disastrous uh, impact of poor punctuation. So here is a very common one. Let's eat grandma as if, you know, grandma is the next thing for your dinner instead of requesting grandma by saying, let's eat, comma, grandma. Now, this is a very common one. The next one I'm going to show might not be so common. 
Uh, it says, I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog. It's such a horrible thought, you cooking your family and your dog. Basically, what this person wants to say is that I find inspiration in three things that is in cooking, in my family, and in my dog. So you can see how you know the comma you know makes a whole difference to the message that you're putting across. Next, I'm going to be talking about uh, the apostrophe and its uses. So here, the first one says, eat your dinner. It's a simple instruction. But look at the next one. You're talking maybe to your cattle where you say, eat and get fattened up because you're my dinner. So there's a lot of difference between your and your with the apostrophe. Though when you're speaking it, it sounds pretty much the same. Next, I'm going to be talking about the importance of the Oxford comma. Now, Oxford comma is a comma that comes before uh, the and it is generally uh, not used uh, these days it's a pretty archaic form but nevertheless it has its own uses so here is an example i want to thank my parents tiffany and god which means that my parents are tiffany and god and i'm born out of a union between tiffany and god okay so what basically this person wants to say is that i want to thank uh, you know my parents i want to thank tiffany and i also want to thank god so these are three distinct three different things uh, next, I'm going to be talking about uh, semicolons and their use. So the first one says, I'm sorry, I love you. And you can sense the amount of frustration uh, behind these words. But look at the second one where you are expressing some kind of genuine regret and you're apologizing with sincerity by saying that I'm sorry, I love you. Now, this is the way maybe semicolons can make a difference. <laughs> The next one, I'm going to be talking about the colon. And I really love this example. Uh, a woman without her man is nothing. You know, So it talks about the importance of the man in a woman's life as if everything a woman does is defined by the presence of a man in her life. But the sentence, you can turn it a 180 degree just by introducing the colon. And let me read out what the next one says, a woman without her man is nothing and this is where you know it uh, gives more importance to the woman and it says that without a woman a man is really nothing you need the support the love and care of a woman uh, next i'm going to be talking about the use of the hyphen now look at this 25 dollar bills which means i have 20 into five dollars which gives me a hundred dollars but if i place the hyphen between the 20 and five then i get $25 bills, OK? So $25 bill means one bill of $25. So this is basically some of the examples that I could get uh, to explain the importance of punctuation in writing. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to be talking about uh, some sentences that we write which are grammatically correct yet they are not logical, uh, they are incoherent sentences. So uh, let me share a few examples with you. <clears throat> If the baby does not drink the milk, boil it. Now, once reading, once uh, after reading, you keep wondering, what should I boil? Should I boil the milk or should I boil the baby? Now, this sentence is grammatically correct, but it does not make any sense. I'm going to show you a second one. I went to my village to sell my land along with my wife, which means that if you buy my land, you get my wife along with my land for free. Now, this is disastrous because here you are using the modifier in the wrong place. Now, what is a modifier? A modifier is nothing but a word. It can be a phrase or it can be a clause. And it modifies the parts of a sentence. So if you place the modifier wrongly, then the entire meaning of the sentence changes. And let me give you one more example. The kind woman handed out sandwiches to all the kids in, in Ziploc bags as if the kids were inside the Ziploc bags uh, rather than the sandwiches which were kept in the Ziploc bags. So this is a problem with misplaced modifiers. And modifiers can be either adjectives or adverbs. So let me go to the next slide. And I'm going to show you how the placement of a modifier in a sentence can change the meaning of a sentence. So the first one says the instructor just nodded to Elvis as she came in. She did not speak or extend her hand. She just nodded at Elvis. The next sentence, the instructor nodded just to Elvis as she came in. She did not uh, you know, uh, nod to anybody else. She ignored everybody else and you know, just nodded to Elvis. And the last one, the instructor nodded to Elvis 
just as she came in. That means, you know, she did it immediately after coming into the room. So this is how, you know, modifiers can make a whole lot of difference to your writing. Uh, next, I'm going to be talking about some deadweight words. And you know these I call it as empty calorie words. You use them, but it does not take your writing any forward. It just adds bulk and quantity to your uh, you know writing, but it does not give any kind of quality or emphasis to your writing. And these are the commonly used words like very, so, a lot, and really. Now, when people have limited vocabulary in order to increase the degree of some word what they do is they keep adding very so a lot and really and it really does not make your writing very good sorry i'm using the word really now here is an example it is very hot today instead of that you can simply say it is excruciatingly hot and excruciatingly is a lot more vivid and carries a lot more weightage and makes your writing better than simply saying it's very hot today Next is, I have so much work. Instead of saying I have so much work, you say I have immense amounts of work. Uh, next, I love to read a lot. Instead, you just say I'm passionate about reading. And the last one, I'm really tired. Instead of you just say I'm exhausted. So what I'm trying to say is that instead of using you know, these words to uh, increase the degree of something, uh, just switch them with some awesome adjectives and your writing will automatically improve. Next, I'm going to be talking about run from the run of the mill. Here I'm talking about idioms that are so overused that they have become cliches. So avoid cliches like you're avoiding the COVID-19. And here are some examples. The grass is always greener on the other side. Now, I keep warning my students if they ever submit me any essay or anything with these kind of cliches thrown in, I'm going to mark them very poorly. So here are other examples. Every coin has two sides. All that glitters isn't gold, a bed of roses. Now, these have been used so much that they have uh, you know, uh, become cliches. And of course, it makes your writing very uh, poor. It makes your writing run of the mill. So if you want your writing to stand out, if you want your writing to be impressive, stop using these cliches and hackneyed phrases. Next, I'm going to be taking a quick glance at business writing. I would have really loved to go into academic writing, but that would need a whole session uh, in itself. So I'm forced to just go to uh, go with business writing. Now, here is a very, very poor sample of business writing. And uh, I have uh, taken uh, this letter that someone wrote uh, to the company that, say, uh, that sells electronic goods. So I will just read it out for you. Dear manager, the television set your store sold me last week is a disgrace. The picture is distorted and flops around so that we cannot look at it. You've sent your repairman twice, and each time the set is worse after he tickers with it. I think you knew that it was no good when you sold it to me and hoped I wouldn't have sense enough to complain. This is the last time I'll ever buy anything from your store, Ben Thomas. Now, Ben Thomas is a poor writer, and I'm going to point out some of the uh, you know, disastrous things he has done in this letter. So let me start with the television set. Now, he does not give any details about the television now a company like chroma or vijay sales must be selling a thousand pieces of television per day uh, in a given area forget about the country and the country so you know you just saying the television set does not help them to identify which model you know which uh, uh, receipt number you're talking about so here there are no details so it's incomplete next he's talking about the store you sold me last week now in a week there are so many days which day exactly did you buy it? There is no information. Uh, look at the next one, flops around. The picture is distorted and it flops around. Now these uh, uh, you know, descriptions are so vague that it does not help the company understand what is the actual problem uh, with the TV. So uh, the description is not at all specific. Uh, next, I'm going to be talking about the word tinkers, and I really love it. Now, this is very poor language. This kind of language is fine when we're having 
a conversation, uh, you know, but when you're writing uh, formally in business writing, then this is a poor choice for like as far as language goes. Uh, next is, uh, you know, I think you knew that it was no good when you sold it to me. Now you're pretty much going and accusing a company uh, deliberately setting out to cheat you. Now no company worth its name will ever do something like this. So when you're making accusations like this, you're doing it without any proof. So your writing lacks proof. Uh, next is uh, this person is saying that you know uh, he, he's complaining, but his complaint is purposeless because in business writing it is all about money. So you have to make it very clear what you want from the company. So instead of asking maybe for a reimbursement or a repair, you know, or or, or a completely new set, this person is just happy, raving and ranting, and he actually does not do anything with his letter, so his business writing is purposeless. So let me go to the next slide, and I'm going to be talking about the five C's of business writing. Now, these letters, these words all start with the letter C, and hence they are known as the five C's. In certain books, you will see there are seven C's, there are eight C's, but I've taken only five for today's purpose. Now, the first one is completeness. You need to answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I would like to give a very interesting example, and this was pointed out to me by one of the participants. Now, whenever uh, people are organizing an event, you know, a webinar, they're giving all kinds of information. They're sharing the date, time, link. But one thing they're not doing is they're not giving the information or the contact number of the contact person. So if anybody has any problems, what happens is they get back to me uh, if they don't get the feedback form or if they haven't received the certificate. Now, I have nothing to do with the feedback form or the certificate, and yet people get back to me because in the poster, which is being circulated, there is no information about uh, you know the contact person. So even though you are sending out a very beautiful, attractive poster, it loses a lot of its purpose because it's incomplete. Next, I'm going to be talking about conciseness, you know, you need to write in the fewest possible words, and I'll be dealing with this uh, in more detail in the next slide. I'll be talking about concreteness and how you quantify and make your words more specific. If clarity is when you decide to choose simple and familiar language for your reader. And the last one is correctness. Whatever you put in terms of writing should be accurate in terms of the facts, figures, language, and even the format of your writing should be correct. Uh, so let me take a uh, 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 talk about you know conciseness and I say time is equal to money in business and short messages are likely to be read more uh, you know readily and you will lose your audience if you have written too much. So let me give you an example of how you know terribly long sentences we write. So you write sometimes we write something like I arrived at the conclusion that. Uh, simply substitute the words highlighted in red with concluded. Instead of saying, I arrived at the conclusion, you can just say, I concluded that. Uh, look at the next one. This is nothing new, yet there's still a lot of low quality content that exists. Now, in the previous slide, I pointed out how a lot is empty calorie words. So instead of using it, you can simply rewrite by the sentence by saying, this is nothing new. Substantial low quality content will uh, exist. And the last one, I really love this one. I had to highlight the entire sentence in red. It says, I want to take this opportunity to tell you that we are grateful to you. Now, instead of writing so much, you simply get done by saying, thank you. And this is not only long, but it is also archaic. And this is a kind of legacy that has uh, you know, been left behind by the British because the relation between uh, the master and servant is gone and it's passe. Today, business is between equals. So you don't have to be uh, so obsequious in your writing style. You can simply say a uh, thank you. Next, I'm going to be talking about how you moved from making poached eggs to boiled eggs. Now, when you crack open an egg and you put it in a pan, it spreads all around the pan in a formless uh, way. So that is poached egg. But when you boil an egg and distill within the shell, it boils into something that is solid, that is well formed, and it is concrete. So what I'm trying to say is that sacrifice vagueness for concreteness. And here are some examples. 
uh, it is very hot today. Now, the concept of heat is uh, uh, very subjective. Somebody who is staying in the equatorial regions, for them, uh, heat is one thing, but it might be something different for somebody who is staying maybe in the Arctic Circle. So instead of saying uh, it's hot today, you make it more specific by saying it's a 40 degrees Celsius today. Uh, next one, she is so intelligent. Now, I don't know how intelligent is intelligent according to you. Instead, right, she has an IQ of 140 on a scale of 150. And the last one, the printer is really fast. Now, how fast is really fast? Instead, just quantify and say the printer prints 60 pages per minute. So when you're talking about business writing, when we're talking about, about academic writing, you need to be able to quantify what you're saying, and that will make your writing better. Next, I'm going to be talking about don't send your readers running to the dictionary. Now, it's all fine to be speaking like Shashi Tharoor, you know, he's very impressive. But to be very honest, half the time what he says, I don't understand. But I'm too ashamed to, you know, tell it in front of people that I could not understand what he said. Uh, this is okay for a speech and it is also okay for creative writing, but this is a complete no-no in business writing because in business writing, if your reader has to go to the dictionary every now and then, he will lose interest in your message and maybe not read it at all. So use simple and familiar words that an average reader understands. And towards this, I'm going to share a story of a plumber. Now, this plumber that you see in the picture, he is not very educated, but he's a very good plumber and he's a kind person who wants to help people. So during his lineup, in his line of work, he realized that if drains get clogged and you pour hydrochloric acid in the concentrated form, then the choked drain kind of opens up because the acid eats away into the dirt and it opens up the passage. So he felt this is a very useful tip. So he wrote uh, to the Standard Bureau and he, to and he told them that in case any of your uh, you know, clients are facing the problem of a clogged drain, then ask them to use hydrochloric acid. Now, the people in the bureau, they realize that if you're, hydrochloric, you're using hydrochloric acid, it does open up the choked drain, but at the same time, it eats away into the metallic pipe. In case the pipe is made of iron, then the acid is also corroding the iron. So what the bureau people wrote back to the um, plumber is to tell him that don't use hydrochloric acid. It's a bad idea. So somebody from the bureau wrote back this message to him. The efficacy of hydrochloric acid is indisputable, but the corrosive residue is incompatible with metallic permanence. Now, this poor uh, plumber, maybe he did not even complete his fifth standard education. Now, he read this message, he did not understand, and he, in fact, thought that the bureau was praising him. So he wrote back a thank you note, and we understand that obviously the purpose of this message was lost. So another person from the bureau tried a second time but the second time was also not much of an improvement because this is what he wrote. We cannot assume responsibility for the production of toxic and noxious residue with hydrochloric acid and suggest you use an alternative procedure. Now, the poor plumber did not understand this message. And again, he wrote back to thank the bureau. So finally, somebody intelligent in the bureau understood that the language is too difficult for him. So he simply wrote back to him saying, don't use hydrochloric acid. It eats out the pipes. And finally, the message went home. Now, this might be a very, very exaggerated and a drastic example. But at times, you know, we end up writing like this and we lose the purpose, the focus of our writing in terms of business writing. So business writing is not the place where you show off your uh, you know, lexical range, keep to simple words and familiar words which everybody can understand. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to be looking at the writing process. And um, one of my mentors, he, he told me that writing is pretty similar uh, to uh, uh, getting pregnant and delivering a baby. So I went online and I found uh, this um, uh, quote, which is uh, kind of echoing what he said. Much of writing might be described as mental pregnancy with successive uh, difficult deliveries. So I'm going to compare the writing process to the different stages of conceiving and delivering a baby. So the writing process is divided into five steps. And I'll, go, I'll be taking you through each one of them. 
Now, the first step is known as the pre-writing, and this is where you get, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 an idea or you get multiple ideas, you fuse them together, and you get the zygote. And this I compare to the conceiving of, you know, um, a child. So the, in the pre-writing, you brainstorm and you organize your ideas into something composite. Now, once you have the idea ready in your head, the next step is to put your idea in the form of writing. And this is known as the drafting stage, where you create a rough copy of your writing. And mind it, this takes the maximum time in the writing process, you know, just like the gestation period might extend to 200 to 250 days. Similarly, in the entire writing process, drafting takes the longest time. Now, once you have drafted the first draft of your writing, then the next stage is revising. And here, you improve your writing. You try out different, you know, maybe beginnings and endings. You try some ornamentation. And this, I call it the, you know, fine tuning or the final days just before you get your, you know, labor pain. So <clears throat> once you've revised your content, then you move on to editing. Now, editing is the most painful part of any writing because here you are not only looking at the overall structure, but you're looking at individual words, you're looking at spelling, you're looking at punctuation. And when I review my own work, because I've been sitting with it for so long, uh, it often happens that I miss out on glaringly obvious mistakes. Uh, it, it simply uh, does not uh, you know, uh, occur to me that these are mistakes. So what I do is I send it to a friend, I consult somebody, and it is better to get your work you know, proofread by some, somebody else in, as in pure proofreading. And uh, this is known, uh, this I've compared it to the labor pains because this is the most uh, you know, problematic part of uh, writing. But once you have done your editing and you have done your fine tuning, then the last bit is the publishing. In publishing, what you do is you write out a fair copy, you draft a fair copy, uh, you know, incorporating all the changes that have happened in the previous drafts. And you can either submit it as an assignment to your teacher, you can either post it online, or you can send it as a manuscript to the publisher. And this is what I know, call as giving birth, where your work actually sees the light of day. Now, when I'm talking about um, and the writing stages, I would like to look at the pre-writing stage. And I want to talk about the use of graphic organizers and how you know effective it is for pre-writing. Now, when we're talking about graphic organizers, the one that is most commonly uh, you know, used is uh, the concept of a mind map. But let me tell you that mind map is only one kind of graphic organizer. There are many graphic organizers, and each type of organizer has a different purpose. So for example, if I'm writing an essay between the difference between uh, maybe a hammerhead shark and a big white shark, then I can use the Venn diagram where I can talk about the differences and similarities. Uh, next, if I'm going to be talking about how to extract cocoa from the cacao bean and then make it into chocolate, I can perhaps use a flow chart. Uh, for tree diagram, let me give you an example. Suppose I want to write an essay on Hitler and his progeny. I can use the tree diagram and uh, maybe the timeline when I'm talking about uh, events uh, from the past that happened in a sequence. Now, when I'm talking about cyclic charts, uh, a good example would be um, how we uh, keep you know, harming uh, the environment around us and uh, the environment, you know, gives a backlash always. So you start from a certain point and you go back. So when you're try to, trying to write maybe an essay, so you can use the cyclic chart. Next, I'm going to be talking about the matrix. A matrix is when you're comparing multiple things and it has multiple factors. For example, I'm taking one of Shakespeare's work, maybe The Tempest, and I want to show what three different critics have said about Tempest in terms of its uh, style and uh, you, you know the content and style. So you have three people in the column, and you have two of these aspects, the content and the style, in a row form. So you know, you're going to look at it in the matrix form. 
The next one, the radial diagram, a uh, mind map, an example of a radial diagram. It is a lot more fluid because it allows you to extend your ideas in 360 degree. And a radial diagram is pretty similar to a tree diagram, but the only difference is that the tree diagram extends only in a single direction. And also the tree diagram has a hierarchy to it. Whereas if you're talking about a radial diagram, the radial diagram does not talk about hierarchy as something being more important or less important. I'm going to show you an example of a mind map in the next slide. In the pyramid, uh, maybe when you're talking about the structure of a short story, it starts with mundane things that you know, it uh, gains in terms of uh, you know, some kind of conflict. And then you reach to some kind of a resolution. And uh, so the, the, the pyramid structure can be used. So use different type of graphic organizers. And uh, as for myself, uh, every time that I prepare for a session, whether it's a webinar, I first sit down and I make a mind map. Once I have the mind map, I have the skeleton structure, then I start putting the flesh to the skeleton. So in the next slide here is an example of a radial diagram. And the mind map is a radial diagram. So if I want my students to write an essay on maybe health and how important is health and how do you, you know, maintain good health. So look at this here. Uh, the person has, uh, you know, uh, taken out one, two, three, four, five main branches. So anybody who looks at this diagram can immediately figure out that they're going to maybe have five paras in, in uh, you know, in the body of uh, of the uh, essay. And look how beautifully they're talking about health and how it is related to diet. Your health is related to good sleep. Your health may be spoiled by overstress uh, when you're overly stressed, and how it can improve by exercise. If none of these are helping, then where do you call out for help? And look how beautifully this person is talking about stress, and he has subdivided into the causes of stress, you know, uh, the effects of stress, and how you can find the solution to stress. So it's so beautifully done. And this is something that I do, uh, you know, and I always encourage my students to do. So even if they are writing something as simple as a resume, a job resume, they still go ahead and do uh, the mind map. And, you know, it's a matter of habit. If you start doing it, you will start applying it for every day, um, for everything that you do in your life. Um, next, I'm going to be talking about the use of plagiarism checkers and please use it without fail now india is a country where we have very little respect for copyright issues right from school our teachers never told us what is copyright but today the world is changing today everything is digital so catching people who are plagiarizing who are cheating somebody else's content has become very very easy so if students think that teachers are fool and they will never know that they have copied everything from the internet then the students need to think again because now even the teachers have recourse to plagiarism checkers so what does a plagiarism checker do it is basically a software you will find a lot of free softwares online all you need to do is you need to uh, you know paste your word document or whatever you're using into the checkbox of the plagiarism checker now once you feed it into your plagiarism checker it looks at every sentence that you have written and it gives you a verdict whether it has been plagiarized and if at all it has been plagiarized it will also give you the source from where it has been plagiarized here this is just a sample so it does not make sense but all you need to say is that every sentence is analyzed and everything that is plagiarized will come highlighted in red if something is not plagiarized and you have written it on your own, then it will be labeled as unique. And because it's unique, there is no source uh, showing that you have stolen it from somewhere. So a good plagiarism report will show you what percentage of your uh, or, you know, written discourse is original and what percent is plagiarized. So if you are talking about you know, good uh, colleges and universities abroad, they have this policy that if you're caught plagiarizing three times, then you are debarred from the university. Now, this is something we do not encourage in India, you know, the concept of not stealing from somebody else. But I suggest that you start asking your students to submit a plagiarism report with every piece of written work that they submit right from fifth standard because these softwares are very easy to use. And this is you know, something, respect for other people's work is something we need to instill at a very early age. Uh, these are things that I learned in my university days, but by the time I'd already stolen so much work from people without even you know, a reference to their work or without even a thank you. So coming from 
plagiarism checkers oh, uh, uh, mind it in plagiarism you don't need to pay much uh, at, um, in fact if at all you're paying plagiarism checkers they are free online so you just need to type in google search free plagiarism checker and you will get so many options uh, next i'm going to be talking about how you save effort by using citation machines now when i was doing my phd i simply spent days first of all learning the apa format of referencing i not only learned i learned it by heart so that i remember exactly where i had to put a comma where colon what is to be in bold what is to be in italics so it was a very very uh, taxing affair and i literally typed out pages of reference but in today's time in the digital era Uh, you know all this effort can be saved simply by using a citation machine now what is a citation machine it allows you to create a citation at the click of a button so you can choose between the apa style the mla style chicago or maybe the oxford style so suppose in this they have chosen the mla style so not only uh, it allows you to look at the mla style so this is for mla 7 it might allow you to go to the mla 8 version also now when you are uh, you know referencing you have different uh, categories for example you can refer from a book magazine newspaper website journals uh, films so in this example let me see that i want to refer to an article from a journal that i've taken so i click on journal and then in this box i just type the name of the article or the name of the journal or the isbn number of the journal and i click search now once you click search this machine will go to the internet and go to all the sources it will collect all the data as in you know who's the author uh, what is the name of the journal what is the volume what is the issue number uh, maybe the year of publication and even the doi digital uh, object identifier and it will make the complete citation and give it to you so it is very very important that you start saving effort in writing by using citation machines and just like your plagiarism checkers your citation machines also come free you just need to look for a free version of it next i'm going to be talking about fistful of writing activities now uh, in school i remember every time we had you know grammar sessions and the teacher would come and say today we're going to write an essay or a composition every kid in the class would go like ah uh-huh, with a big sigh because we were simply not interested in writing you know compositions and essays we found it so boring and mostly because the topics that were given to us were so boring that did not inspire any kind of enthusiasm amongst the students to write anything so for example if you go ahead and tell your students that write an essay on how you spent your days during the lockdown i mean how boring is it people have already lived uh, you know through the days of lockdown it was terrible enough why would they want to recount the entire experience by writing about it for a school essay so don't give them topics which are boring uh, and the next thing is that if you want your students to write the first thing is to get them interested in writing is to explain to them that writing can be fun so don't go for a lot of structured writing right in the beginning start with creative writing and once the students start exp- ex- enjoying uh, the act of writing then maybe you can go to more structured things so let me give you an example uh, here i'm going to call it a sack full of words so i want my students to write a day that they spent on the beach now you will go ahead and tell me how is this topic any more uh, you know attractive than the previous one that you gave us an example about the lockdown period of course it is not interesting but see how am i how am i going to make it more challenging to the students so once i say that you're going to write a description of a day spent on the beach next thing i tell my students is tell me words that you can come up with when you think of the beach or you associate with the beach so they start coming up with words like sun sand beach you know uh, swimsuit ball umbrella sunscreen cold drinks ice cream so every student maybe would give you two or three words each and you can write it on the blackboard but now since you don't have the blackboard you can use a word cloud that comes in mentimeter and you will have a whole collection of words in your screen within maybe 3 or 4 minutes now once you have these words on your screen then the next thing you do is you tell your students now i'm going to put all these words in a sack and i'm going to throw the sack out of the window i'm going to chuck the sack out of the window and now you can to write the same description of a day spent on the beach but you cannot use any of the words which are given here in the sack 
So now the students are in a dizzy, like how can you possibly write about the beach when the sand is missing, when the, you know, maybe the swimsuit and umbrella and the boats are missing. So this is when they start feeling challenged and then they rise up to the challenge and they realize that, you know, with a little bit of creativity, you can get over this problem. So let me tell you what students do. So instead of writing about they spend on the beach in the daytime, they move to the nighttime. Because once you move to the nighttime, you won't need words like sun, you won't need words like sunrise, sunscreen, uh, you know, umbrella. So more than half the words in the sack uh, are, are not required anymore. Next, I have seen students, uh, instead of you know, talking about a beach in a tropical uh, land, they talk about a beach which is maybe set in the Arctic Circle where the water is frozen over and you, know, you don't need uh, waves and things like that. So with a little bit of creativity, the students are able to come up with fantastic you know, description of a day spent on the beach even without uh, you know, taking recourse to these words. So this is what I call is a sack full of words. This is just a blueprint. You can use these similar ideas for other writing. Uh, next, I'm going to be talking about the retelling of old tales. Now, here is the story of Chicken Little. And we all know how an acorn fell on Chicken Little's head, and he, he started shouting that the sky is falling, and the fox takes them to his den and you know, eats them up. So this is the traditional story that we know of. But I tell my students, and uh, maybe in the workshops that I do for the teachers, I tell them that I want you to rewrite the story with a completely different, unexpected ending. So let me share one of the stories that the teachers made. And I really loved it, the way they turned it around. So uh, Chicken Little starts screaming that, you know, there is a bomb that has dropped on my head. So terrorists are here at hand. So we need to hide from the bombing. So Chicken Little starts, you know, shouting and running around the entire jungle and collects all the other, uh, you know, animals. And uh, on the way, they meet the fox. And the fox says that, you know, my den is a, a good one. It's a strong one. It's way down uh, into the earth. So it will be pretty safe for you people if you come into my den. So even if there is some amount of bombing, we'll all be safe. So all of them go into the fox's den. And once they're inside the den, everybody is expecting that the now the fox will do something. But it is the chicken little, surprisingly, who brings out an AK-47, shoots everybody. And the dialogue the chicken little gives is that, I don't know why the poor fox is always the villain in a story. So here you see that chicken little himself was the terrorist. So this is what I ta ta uh, I'm talking about, retelling of old tales. So you can take all the existing fairy tales that we have, the fables, and you can make it into a very interesting writing writing activity. And the last one that I'm going to be talking about is the name place animal thing starter pack. Now, in this, I generally gave my uh, students, uh, you know, a name It can be a well known famous name. For example, here I've used Captain Jack Sparrow. And then you can give them a place. I've given them this USS Enterprise, which is the Star Trek, uh, you know, uh, spaceship. Uh, so this is your location, the place. Uh, the animal is a happy hippo. And the thing that I want is a feeding bottle. Now you have to combine all these four things which are really not connected to each other. And that takes a lot of skill. And I want you to convert it into a story. But when they're making a story, they have to keep in mind that they have to talk about the situation. Then it has to escalate to some kind of a conflict. And the story will not be over until you come to some sort of a resolution. So once they put this entire mixture into this framework, then what they get is a fascinating story. Now, this is all I can do in the one hour that was given to me. So I want to summarize writing skills by using uh, three different quotes by very famous authors. Now, the first one I call is immersion. If you want to learn how to swim, you have to get into the water. You have to get wet in times you might have to drown sometimes, and then only will you become a swimmer. And the same thing can be applied to being a writer. You can be a writer only by writing. And I took the liberty of adding this A. I don't know why this A was missing. I felt it was not correct. So the best way of learning to write is to start writing. You know. Next, I'm going to be talking about show, don't tell. Now, even in business writing, 
show the benefit to the uh, you, you know to, to the reader only then in your writing will be good so here uh, Shekhov says don't tell me the moon is shining show me the glint of light and broken glass so again I'll repeat show don't tell to your writing and the last one brevity is the soul of wit and uh, Orwell says if it is possible to cut a word out always cut it out the shorter it is the better it is even for creative writing nobody really has the patience to read pages so this is all i have to say in terms of writing skills and the last slide if you have any queries then you can uh, you know whatsapp me and uh, you can also mail back to me i have recently made a youtube channel called tall talks from a short lady in case you enjoyed my webinar it is a request for me uh, to you to subscribe to my channel because i keep uploading material onto my channel and every time i upload something you will uh, get a, a, you know a kind of a ping or an alert so please subscribe to about five seconds from your busy schedule and with that i will say thank you and bye from my side um, I will stop sharing my screen now. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Biswas. It was, I think it was one of the, you know, detailed sessions we uh, watched after a long time. It was really lovely. Uh, that's the reason we didn't have, don't have many questions for you. There are not like, you know, but uh, I got two, three questions. So I uh, like, I will just read out one or two questions for you. So if you can answer those, okay. Yes. So just uh, the first one, some, um, uh, miss, uh, I don't know, sorry if I'm you know, saying the name wrong. Uh, Mamun Kider, the question is, am I supposed, uh, uh, what is the difference between uh, scientific and academic writing? Uh, oh, okay, uh, scientific, write, uh, scientific and writing academic. can, uh, yeah, scientific writing can come uh, uh, under uh, technical writing and it can also come under academic writing. So if you're publishing your scientific writing in journals and all, then it would come under uh, 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 academic writing. But in terms, suppose you are uh, making an instruction manual uh, you know, to use uh, some software and to install it, then it would come under uh, technical or business writing. So it can go in both. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, though you have spoken uh, you know, in detail about plagiarism, I would like to read the question which has come. I think it came before you uh, started speaking about plagiarism, like how to avoid plagiarism uh, from Kirubakaran. How yeah, to it's avoid very simple. Uh, uh, you read other people's work, but then you shut, uh, you know, what you're reading and then you rewrite about it, you paraphrase it in your own words and always give credit to somebody from where you've taken the idea. It's very simple to avoid plagiarism. Just don't copy paste, which is the easiest thing to do and which is, which is uh, what students are doing every day, day in, day out. So, yeah, that is the way to avoid. Another question from Ms. Maria. Is online plagiarism checker reliable? Yes, um, uh, I use free versions of uh, plagiarism checkers and for every paper that I send for publishing, I'm using that and it's pretty good. And to be uh, on the safe side, what I do is I use multiple plagiarism checkers. I don't depend on one. I use maybe three and I see in what kind of results they're giving. So of course, if you're uh, you know purchasing a paid version, it is uh, much more fine-tuned, but if you're using free ones also it is good but there is one problem with plagiarism checkers which many people tell me is that the plagiarism checker they can actually take your work and steal your ideas and use it for something else so that is one thing that you have to be careful about while using plagiarism. but uh, you know the benefits are much more than the problems so do use and for school children i don't think their essays are really that uh, great that somebody would want to steal it so it's absolutely fine for people students to use uh, plagiarism checkers the free versions um it, it, it also uh, good institutions they have their own uh, corporate accounts of plagiarism checkers so start using that okay uh, another question from mr amul bansore and it's how can we incorporate humor in writing Okay, uh, so uh, yes, 
uh, see, your humor is something that is inborn. Either you're a humorous person or you kind of train yourself by uh, you know, listening and looking at how, how other people. So either it is by imitation or it should be coming naturally. So if it's not natural, then imitation is the only other way. Okay, I think this could be the last question for the day. Uh, some uh, from Arti Prasad. How do we account for the Indian socio linguistic contexts in academic writing in English? In other words, how is this monolingual norm applicable in Indian context? Do I read you one more time? Uh, I, I'm really lost. Uh, uh, Just a minute. I will read it one more time. Yeah, it's a, I will read the second part. That is a shorter one. How is this monolingual norm applicable to Indian context? That is Indian social or linguistic context in academic writing. Like um, I think some. I don't know what you mean by monolingual because Indians. Uh, by definition, we are multilingual, so we are proficient with uh, more than maybe three or four languages. So I am sorry, ma'am, I really did not uh, understand how uh, this uh, question. I'm, I'm really sorry. Maybe you can write back to me and we can discuss this. Uh, okay. I think, uh, that's a lot of comments have come. Like, you know, you must be acquainted. Those are all. Like, uh, you know, thank you and wonderful session, very in-depth. And I too will say that, yeah, it was uh, absolutely an in-depth and detailed station starting from, uh, you know, communication skills, the four skills and ending to writing skills, which is one of the most important skills. So uh, I would take this opportunity again to thank you for being here for such a lovely session. Then the, for the participants, because from the comments, I could see that they have actively been in the, though they are not able to speak, uh, if they had got a chance to speak, they could have you know, interacted better. But uh, from here, I could see that everyone had enjoyed the session and uh, been an active participant. So thank you all the participants. Thank you the college, the management for helping us, the Department of English to organize this webinar and uh, the I would last, I would like to thank all the, the tech team, that's the visual communication department of our college. The, without them, uh, this program could not be continued in this you know, smooth way. And uh, I wish and I welcome all of you for the upcoming sessions, which are going to happen tomorrow, day after tomorrow till Saturday. All those are there. Please uh, be in the you know, WhatsApp groups and the links which we have provided. And uh, all the details, uh, I think it is already shown on the screen. So tomorrow's session, that is, uh, that's also extremely interesting. You know, uh, you if you uh, be there, you will be able to understand how interesting. In the same way, so thank you for being there. Have a lovely evening, and uh, see you tomorrow again at uh, four. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.